Welcome to Fading Memories, a podcast with advice, wisdom, and hope from caregivers who have lived the experience and survived to tell the tale. Think of us as your caregiver best friend. Welcome back, Fading Memories listeners, and once again, thank you for selecting our podcast for your listening pleasure. Today, I have Helen Bauer. She is from the Heart of Hospice podcast. And we are going to be discussing, oh, I guess hospice today. So thanks for joining me, Helen. Well, it's so nice to be with you. Thank you. So tell us a little bit about your background first. I was on your show and I'm going to share a link to that just in case people would like to check you out. Be easy, but give us your background because you are far more than quote unquote, just a podcaster. <laughs> just a podcaster. So actually, I, I've always referred to myself as just a nurse. I've been a nurse for just over 30 years, um, and for the last 12 or so years, I've been working in hospice and end-of-life care. I am hospice and palliative care certified as a a registered nurse, and for the last six years, I have been the co-host of the Heart of Hospice podcast. Awesome. So it's it's a pleasure and a wonderful industry to work in. That's that's good to hear. So... Since you mentioned that you are also palliative care certified, can you tell us the difference between hospice and palliative care? Because I only learned about palliative care like pretty much at the end of my mom's life. So I was not able to take advantage of that wonderful service. Well, I have a very um, simple definition because I've never worked in strictly the palliative care side of things. But all of hospice includes palliative care or palliation. Um, So here's my my simple definition of it. So hospice is about end-of-life care, no longer pursuing treatment, only pursuing comfort and symptom management. Palliative care is care that provides a great deal of that, but the patient can still pursue treatment. So it's palliation and symptom management along with treatment at the same time. And my understanding, because I did talk to somebody a ways back about palliative care, is it also really helps support the person providing the care. So it helps us caregivers. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. That's sort of 50% of our jobs is to take care of the caregivers. Well, we definitely need it. I say we just because that's where I was at. But right now I'm just taking care of a husband. <laughs> so well, then you are a caregiver of sorts. Well, right now he's got an uh, an issue that's getting dealt with. It's not nothing life threatening other than there's times I'd like to choke him. But, you know, he's <laughs> he when we moved into our home, he stepped on a tack because we were getting flooring installed. And it, he stepped on it through his slipper and he has neuropathy in his feet. So he wasn't really aware of it until the end of the day. And so he's had this wound on the bottom of his foot. And I finally looked at him because my dad had diabetes for uh, like 20 some odd years, I think. And I'm like, you know, you're pre-diabetic. You need to talk to a podiatrist, blah, blah, blah. And so he did. And basically it's a pretty big open wound, can't put pressure on it. So he's on crutches and little wheelie scooter and he's driving me crazy. (laughs) Oh, wow. Yeah. That's part of the job of a a caregiver, right? But there, there are something like 55 million unpaid caregivers across the United States. And I think that's probably an undercount because after my dad passed away, I didn't consider myself a caregiver because my mom was in memory care. And it wasn't until I attended my first Alzheimer's caregiver support group through the Alzheimer's Association when the facilitator said, you are a caregiver even if, and then she basically laid out all of the um, different scenarios that all of us, you know, like if you live with your person or if they're in memory care or if you're just helping support the spouse of the person that's got dementia or Alzheimer's. And I was like, oh, okay, I guess I'm a caregiver. (laughs) So sure. Well, and you know, we do remote caregiving in this day and age where caregivers are flung 3000 miles from their person, their loved one. So yeah, uh, even remote caregiving from a distance, if you provide support, that's caregiving. That is true. So I want to talk about 
like how to know when it's time to consider hospice and when it's time to call in hospice. And then I have a question related to that is, does hospice always have to be, for lack of a better term, prescribed by your doctor? Okay, so the first, I'll answer the second question first. Yes, you always have to have an order from your physician to be able to get on to hospice. Your, your doctor is going to write what we call a certification of terminal illness, basically says there's a limited life expectancy of six months or less. Um, now, you don't have to have that to be able to talk to an agency and get information. You can certainly interview or just get information from a hospice agency if you want. You don't have to have a doctor's order for that. But yes, to actually be admitted onto hospice, you have to have a physician's order. So you want you want to hear a fun story about hospice? Yes. My, well, doctors, not hospice. So my dad, as I mentioned, was diabetic. He had a kidney transplant in 2009. In 2016, he kept talking about having to prepare for the end, prepare for the end. And I just thought he was being a little melodramatic. I knew that he did not want to go back on to dialysis. Anybody that's not familiar with that, dialysis is not a way, it's not a way of life. It's just a way to maintain life. You'd think it would make you feel good. It does not. Yeah. Uh, it's very exhausting for some reason. I don't, I don't ever plan on experiencing that. So I'm not... Sure, I understand all the reasonings, but it's not, it, it sucks up a lot of your time and it doesn't really make you feel better. It just keeps you from dying. And so I knew he, wa he that was his wishes and I was okay with that. I mean, I knew what it meant and that was what he wanted and that was fine. So in the fall, so November 29th, 2016, my whole family goes to spend time with my parents, put up Christmas decorations. Regular listeners have heard this story. And my dad was totally out of it. He was lethargic. He apparently had urinated on himself. He kept saying, I just need some rest. I just need some rest. And he thought it was 1998, which was terrifying because my mom was in advanced Alzheimer's. It was like, holy crap, what is going on? And I really, really, really wish I'd known what was going on because my dad spent 38 days in the hospital getting dialysis treatments. His nephrologist, for those who don't know, that is a kidney doctor, kept saying, once we clear the toxins out of his system, you know, his memory should return. That never happened. And it got to the point when they finally were like, I think they were going to wheel him out of the hospital, regardless of what I said. She, she called me and said, now you're going to have to drive your dad to dialysis and you're going to have to sit with him because he's confused and he keeps pulling out the lines. And I'm like, excuse me, I work. <laughs> I'm like, hello, <laughs> that's really not an option. And we're talking like a 25 to 30 hour a week commitment. And what, what am I supposed to do with my mother? I'm like, hello, we need to have a conversation about this. Right. Well, that was all that was going through my head. And so I said, you know, <clears throat> that's not going to work. But regardless of if the family can make all that happen, because my sister's younger and she worked and she had kids at home. Um, you know, we're in a very dark gray area of not respecting my dad's advanced directive. And I really think based on what he has told me he wants and what is written down in his advanced directive that we need to consider hospice. You know what I heard after that? Click. Absolutely nothing. She hung up. She hung up on me. This was my dad's personal doctor. Wow. Yeah, I have repeatedly said, when she's lucky I live two hours away now, she better not ever walk in front of my car. It's a yeah, hybrid. It's it quiet. Is. You will not know I'm coming. I mean, the disrespect for me, my dad, my family, just, the, I'm like, you know what his wishes are. Like, you're his doctor. This was not the emergency room people or the hospital people. This was his personal doctor. So, so he went to home. I wonder if there was some ignorance there. A need for education. I, I'm giving this doctor the benefit of the doubt, but I I'm not that kind because I, I I boil it down to they don't make money when they're on hospice. And our system is not geared, you know, it's a for profit system. I think that's a problem, but that's a whole other podcast. <laughs> We're not gonna dive into that one. We'll be here all week. But yeah, so he went home for a week. 
His preferred chair was one step down into a, quote, sunken living room. It was really one step down. And he tripped, and he he tripped going up the step and fell and hit his head. There was caregivers in the home, but my dad was bigger than all of them. So, you know, this is another reason why caregivers need to understand you can't always physically care for somebody, especially when, like, my whole family has a tendency to be a bit ornery. My dad didn't want help, so he fell and hit his head and ended up in the hospital. And thankfully, it was a different hospital because I basically said we're not sending him back to the other one. And those doctors, that when I said, you know, I, he's supposed to be going home on hospice, they were like, oh, yeah, that's good. <laughs> so <laughs> I that's thought if I have to that. fight with another set of doctors on hospice, it's going to get really ugly really fast. <laughs> right, right. But the, so I am 100% in favor of hospice. It seems that most of the people I deal with, they – they wait way too long. So especially with somebody with dementia or Alzheimer's, it's really hard to know. But lately, and I think the universe is trying to tell me that it's time for this episode again. I've seen, you know, talk to people who are like, well, this is probably, you know, my last Easter with my dad, or this is the last blah, blah, blah with my loved one. You got to get it. And yet they're still resistant on getting hospice and it makes me want to scream. So when do we know, how do we know when it's time to basically tell the doctor it's time? <laughs> well, there are a lot of different things to look at. So what I recommend when I'm, when somebody's asking me this as a hospice nurse, I sort of drag out a mental checklist and I tell them to think about what's happened over the last year, multiple hospitalizations or rehospitalizations, infections that recur or new infections that come up. And that includes everything from bacterial, viral, yeast type infections that all indicates that the immune system isn't functioning well. Multiple falls, like your dad had, that's a, a common indicator. And then you look for changes in the patient's mentation, in their speech. You can look for changes or decline in how well they manage the basic activities of their day, what we call activities of daily living, ADLs. Are they having difficulty getting dressed or moving around the house? Mobility changes to where they're needing equipment or even something as simple as supporting themselves on a piece of furniture or a hand against the wall to get around. Um, changes in whether they can manage getting their own meals or managing their own household finances. Can they manage their personal care, which is another ADL? Um, are they able to shower the way they were? Or they um, have they become intolerant of it due to shortness of breath or weakness, you know, poor endurance? Those are all things to look at. Um, and then changes in functioning, like can they feed themselves? Do they remember to eat meals? Do they remember to fix their meals? And with Alzheimer's and dementia patients, of course, we look very closely in um, at memory and speech and communication. So somebody with advanced Alzheimer's who maybe has gone from uh, walking on their own or with an aid or being able to feed themselves with little or no assistance to needing a lot more help, that yes. might be an indication? Yes. Um, also, as it advances even further, difficulty with their swallowing, maybe they cough during a meal or even what we do call, what they do, what we call pocketing food, where they'll chew, but it's almost as if they forget to swallow and you find a little pocket of food on the side. And if you say you need to swallow that with that prompting, they may swallow. And yes, going from using utensils to not being able to use utensils, you know, basically treating every food as if it were a finger food, that's definitely a cognitive decline that we look at when. We look at whether an Alzheimer's, dementia, Parkinson's patient is um, ready or meets hospice criteria. Definitely. Communication is a big one. How well they communicate, um, what their memory recall is like, whether they've had issues where they're forgetting long-term memories versus short-term memories. A lot of Alzheimer's and dementia patients have issues with short-term memory but they may be able to recall something that happened 50 years ago 
you know, a childhood memory. Um, so communication is a big thing. We look at whether their speech is altered, whether they begin to have limited vocabulary um, or even to the point where they get what we have word salad, which is basically when you think of a salad, having all those ingredients that you toss in lettuce, tomato, cucumbers, croutons, and their words become like that. So they may have nonsensical communication and it's just a string of words that may be unrelated. You know, no, no realistic thought there, no reality based thought. And of course, the hospitalizations and all those things that you would see clinically, the memory, the functional changes, the mobility changes. But in addition, you would look at somebody that might have um, a severe diagnosis, something that has not responded to treatment. You know, so cancer is a typical diagnosis that we have in hospice, but just under half of our patients in hospice are cancer patients. We also have heart patients, kidney failure patients, cardiac patients, respiratory patients. There's so many different diagnoses. Um, so having um, a disease that has progressed and gotten worse despite treatment or having optimal treatment treatment and you're getting everything that's out there for that particular diagnosis, but it's, you're sort of maxed out on the treatment and it's as good as it's going to get in other words. And a lot of that is in collaboration with your doctor. So if you see that in your loved one, all those different things over the last year, you can certainly approach your doctor and any doctor worth his or her salt will take it under advisement. You know, you've had an experience where a doctor wasn't receptive to having that conversation. Any doctor worthy of the name will sit down with a family and listen to them. They are not there in the home. Typically, a doctor will only have contact with a patient in the hospital, which is a controlled setting that is not the patient's environment, or in the doctor's office. Again, a controlled setting that is not the patient's environment. So the family is really the source of information and the advocate for saying, this is what we have right now. This is where we are. You may not be watching him eat a meal, but he can no longer use utensils. That makes sense. Yeah. yeah. So the family is a big source of information. So if you can check off a lot of those boxes and you see that happening to your loved one, absolutely. It's time to talk to the doctor. And hopefully they won't hang up on you. No kidding. Super important that you have a doctor who will collaborate with you. What I tell my, my mom, my mom is 89, so she is of a generation that whatever the doctor said is what you did. It wasn't so much about the patient's autonomy or the right to choose, but the doctor was in charge and chose for you because he knew you better basically than you knew yourself. I would say that the doctor knows you clinically better than you might know yourself, but you know yourself as a whole person, body, mind, and spirit much better than your physician does. So what I tell my mom is the physician is only the quarterback. The patient is the coach for the team. So they get to be in charge. That's a, that's a good analogy. And you were listing things to, to look for in somebody with some form of dementia. And my mom walked just fine with no AIDS she spoke in clear English words, but there was no context. So a little bit of the word salad. It made sense, except that it was like stepping into the room in the middle of somebody else's conversation. You're like, I understood what she said, but I don't have any background. So I'm not entirely sure it was word salad, but it was close, mm -hmm. I think. So and no then context she and no no relation to what was happening right then in the moment. Exactly. And then she had an unobserved fall and needed stitches over her eye. That was the beginning. And then um, what was the other thing? She had the fall then. And so that was the end of 2019, literally like December 30th. <laughs> and um, she fell and broke her leg March 8th. So stuff was definitely changing and she did have hospice at the end, although it was basically for two weeks. Mm -hmm. But, you know, obviously I could have brought it in maybe at the beginning of January. And I don't know. 
it's I don't, it's, it's, it's a very confusing know. time. <laughs> it is a very confusing time. And, you know, really, I think Alzheimer's and dementia patients, they take, they sort of go at their own pace. And there's more than one type of dementia. There's Lewy body dementia, there's vascular dementia, and it looks like different things. It can, it can mimic some mental illness, you know, and, and people's response times slow down as they get older anyway. So maybe a fall or needing a mobility aid wouldn't be all that unusual. You know, another thing that I, I didn't mention was having changes in bathroom habits, being able to control the bladder or controlling the bowels. That's another big change. You know, um, but a lot of women have stress incontinence, urinary incontinence as they get older. A lot of men have prostate issues. So, you know, hesitancy, dribbling when they urinate, that may or may not be a sign of Alzheimer's and dementia. There's so much that goes into it. So I think there's a lot of nuance. Let's say a lot of, I, I think that's the best word. There's a lot of nuance when it comes to deciding whether an Alzheimer's and dementia patient is ready, quote unquote, for hospice. So my recommendation is if someone were to ask me, I always say, go ahead and have the conversation now. If it's too soon, that's fine. You've added to the information that you're going to need at some point, but go ahead and have the conversation, get your healthcare team on board, start talking about advanced care planning and how you would manage that caregiving environment especially like what you were saying when you're anticipating, you know, the, the dream in our head is mom or dad would stay at home. We would have a live-in caregiver, whether it's a family or a paid person, and they would be able to be cared for well and safely there. That's not always the case. Sometimes that's not a safe environment for mom or dad. Yeah. My parents' house was reasonable. It wasn't unsafe, but it had the step down into the living room where my dad spent most of his time and a step down into the family room. So there's the only two rooms with steps. And we had, obviously, because my mom had advanced Alzheimer's and my dad was on hospice, we had 24-7 caregivers. Some of them were amazing angels. Some of them were just wonderful people. And a couple of them were not that great. And, you know, you cannot manage 24-hour caregivers from 20 miles away and my sister was slightly farther in the middle of the night and it was the middle of the night people the evening late people you know the crappy hours basically <laughs> that weren't so hot and you know it just I think they're like my and I hesitate to get too too graphic but my my dad had edema so the swelling of the feet and the legs and they leaked so there was things that needed to be done to like kind of deal with it. And one caregiver was like, I can't do this. And I'm like, then don't come back. Cause I'm like not driving half an hour each way to like wrap my dad's legs. And uh, it was, it was just, <laughs> I don't blame her, but that wasn't, you know, that's why I don't do those jobs. Cause I'm, I'm not into the ick factor, but. I was just going to say as a remote caregiver like that, you're basically managing a small healthcare team. Your, your mom and your dad's house became a facility with two patients and you're running an around the clock staff from, I don't know about you, away. but yeah, from, from a distance, that's really hard to do. And it's super expensive and there's so much riding on it. So, you know, the care of these people who can't be left by themselves. And you had to always wonder, I mean, you know, my brother-in-law worked, um, he Quasi managed a grocery store and he would, he had some funky hours because it worked out for the, his family. And so he would kind of pop in sometimes around 11, kind of check in, but you know, he'd worked all day and he wanted to get home and it wasn't, it wasn't on route, but it wasn't a hundred percent out of the way. So it was kind of one of those like, eh, it's not that hard, but it's like not that easy either. You know, and it's just, that's a lot to ask for people to just like, Oh, you know, you've already worked, you know, eight hours, nine hours. Can you also now stop at the house and pray that there's no crisis, emergency problem to deal with that now you're going to have to deal with because, you know, the my sister and I are in bed or whatever. And it's just like, oh, you know, it's just it was not fun. And you said it was expensive. This was 2017 it was $700 a day for yes. 24 hour care. It's very expensive. Yeah. The the uh, memory care my mom was in was cheaper. So. 
just take that with a grain of salt. So yeah. I know people whose doctors have said, yeah, I think, you know, it's it's time to evaluate them for hospice. And the family goes home and they think about it and they kind of, you know, they they know that it's probably time, but they just they kind of hesitate and they drag their feet. And even with my charming experience with my dad's doctor, I didn't hesitate because I knew that that's what he needed. I knew he did not want to be on dialysis. I think he was done dealing with my mom, which sounds terrible, but he was exhausted. And I think he just wanted to check out. He wanted to not do dialysis and, you know, fall asleep and go into a diabetic coma and not wake up. That's usually what happens. It's not what happened with him. (laughs) He had to do it the hard way. But I don't understand the hesitation. So if if you've asked your doctor about, you know, should they be on palliative care or hospice or the doctor says, I think it's time to consider hospice. And I know a lot of doctors are probably hesitant to bring that up first because it kind of sounds like maybe they're, I think they're afraid people will assume that the doctor is giving up, which isn't really the case, except that sometimes there's nothing else to do, but make them comfortable and give them as much quality as we can at the end. But how do we kind of get past or help people get past that? Yeah, I know it's probably time, but insert rationale here. Now we're going to take a quick break for an ad. These ads help me continue to bring the show to you for free. When I learned that despite eating as healthy as possible, we can still have undernourished brains, I was frustrated. I also live in a farming community, so I'm aware that our food isn't grown as well as we need. Learning about Neuro Reserves, Relevate, and how it's formulated to fix this problem convinced me to give them a try. Now I know many of you are skeptical, as was I. However, I know it's working because of one simple change. My sweet tooth is gone. I didn't expect that, and it's not something other users have commented on, but here's some truth. My brain always wanted something sweet. Now fruit usually did the trick, but not always. One bad night's sleep would fire up my sugar cravings so much they were almost impossible to ignore. You ever have your brain screaming for a donut? Well, for me, those days are gone. It's been about six months since I started taking the supplement and I have no regrets. I believe in my results so much that I'm passing on my 15% discount to you. Try it for two or three months and see if you have a miraculous sweet tooth cure or maybe just better focus and clarity. It's definitely worth a try. Now back to our conversation. Well, there's so many rationales. Unfortunately, people have so many reasons for either putting it off or completely ignoring the possibility of utilizing hospice to begin with. I mean, it could be related to a previous experience 30 years ago with another family member. And of course, hospice has changed and evolved. I I like to think that we're much better than we were. Um, There are culture, cultural influences as well. Um, You know, in the communities of color across the United States, there's such a distrust distrust of the healthcare industry in general. You know, uh, among the African-American community, there is a huge disparity in utilization of hospice. A lot of it has to do with the way they have been treated, the disparity of the treatment, it's it's the inequity, the Tuskegee experiment and things like that. We have created as an industry, this culture of distrust for African-American people, people of color. And then you've got communities, the Hispanic culture, where their families are very highly insulated and they care for their elderly and they're ill in well-insulated households. So a lot of times that utilization is low as well. And the Native American culture is very similar with a a huge distrust of the established healthcare system in the United States. So I think there are a whole lot of different reasons, but the two biggest in my experience would be denial of what's getting ready to happen which we all know is going to happen to all of us because a hundred percent of the people that are listening to this call are going to die. Right. Hopefully not um, today. <laughs> not, not today. We don't wish anything on anybody, but I think denial is the other one. And I would say that 
misinformation or ignorance is the other reason. And not ignorance in a disrespectful way, ignorance in that I don't know anything about chemical engineering. I am ignorant of that topic, <laughs> that job, you know, that industry. And I think a lot of people are just ignorant of what hospice is. Um, one of the reasons we started the Heart of Hospice podcast is because we have heard so many people say, I've heard this hundreds of times, I wish we had known about this sooner. That's yep, a lack of education. And a lot of that comes from within, within the healthcare industry. Those are clinicians that don't take, an advan- take the advantage and the opportunity to provide upstream education early, early on in a diagnosis. And I am a firm believer that that phrase, there's nothing else we can do, should be stricken, stricken from anything, any correspondence, any way we communicate with any patient and family inside the healthcare industry. Because as a hospice nurse, I will tell you, when I've given you all the meds, when the other disciplines have seen you, when the spiritual counseling has happened, when the psychosocial interventions in the family conferences have occurred, the hospice nurse will do anything she can. And at that point, we will sit and we will breathe with you match our breathing to a patient's breathing, because there is always something we can do, even down to the most simple intervention. But I I do think denial, pushing it off, if we don't discuss it, then it's not going to happen. And education, a lack of education. I think in one instance that I've where I've had this conversation with somebody who's admitted, yeah, this is the last, probably last, you know, they, this is the last X, this is the last Y. Mm-hmm. I'm appreciating all these moments now, which all that is fantastic. So they're very cognitive of what's happening. And then they find out that there's like one hospice provider in their area. And it's like, that's, I hope that's not the case where we've moved. There was a lot of options where I lived was not the same county as San Francisco, but within the San Fr- seven counties of the San Francisco Bay Area, there was lots of choices, almost too many. <laughs> and, you know, it's just, I wonder if that might be one of the reasons it's just kind of like, kind of resistant, because it's like, well, if I only have this one choice, why, you know, maybe it's, it's, it feels like not, not having a choice. So they yeah. just don't make one. A lack of but- autonomy. There is a lack of access. I mean, that that happens. We have like Texas, where I'm from, it's a huge state, but we have rural areas that are underserved. So there is lack of access. The federal government has even addressed this for rural hospices across the United States because it is really difficult. You live in a remote town, little bitty. It could be that maybe you don't have a lot of choices for your hospice agency or they're unable to get staff. I mean, that happens if they need therapists or social workers, they may have an an issue hiring and retaining those people because of the remote area. So yeah, rural access to hospice can be a challenge. Well, I'm not very far from Sacramento, so let's hope. (laughs) (laughs) It's definitely more rural than where I lived, which was a formal, former agricultural only town that just blocked, I mean, basically... Because where we live now, the infrastructure is much older compared to where we lived. And my husband reminds me that our town, 80% of it was built in like the last 30 years, which isn't that far back. So it's just interesting to experience new places. It's definitely beneficial to my brain, but it's definitely weird. So let's hope. Let's hope I don't need to find out anytime soon about the choices for hospice. But one of the things I don't think people know And you were talking about education, and I fully agree that that's important, which is why we're talking. Tell us exactly, because I know because I've been through it, although I didn't get to interact with my mom's hospice care team too much because the COVID thing hit right as the time that they started taking care of my mom. My mom was in a memory community, so they were sort of a support for those people as well as my sister and I, but we couldn't go see my mom for the last two weeks for life, so... I know the hospice nurse was going, but I don't know. 
I doubt that the chaplain and the social worker and all those extra people were going, but I don't know how many people know that hospice is more than just somebody like yourself. So can you explain exactly what a hospice team is and what they provide for the, the person who is dying and their family? Sure. That's one of my favorite things to talk about because it is a very unique and very special um, aspect of hospice. We have what we call an interdisciplinary team, an IDT is how you may hear people refer to it, or an IDG, an interdisciplinary group. And it's composed, the core group is a physician, a registered nurse, a social worker, and a spiritual counselor, which commonly we call a chaplain. But beyond the the core team, we have a bereavement coordinator. We have a volunteer coordinator and volunteers. We have aides that provide our personal care. We might have other therapies, physical therapy, speech therapy, occupational therapy. And then we might have things like music therapists, um, massage therapists, aromatherapists, pet therapy. It's, It's really a robust circle that teams up to provide the care for patients. Um, The people that you see in the home are going to be the nurse. uh, And that you can't do without the nurse. You can actually refuse. A patient can actually refuse to have the other disciplines, depending on what their needs are. But you have to have the nurse that's required. And the nurse collaborates with the physician. The physician doesn't typically make visits unless there's a special need but the nurse comes out at least every two weeks, at least once every two weeks. Social worker and chaplain also make visits in the home and the aide is uh, making visits in the home as well to help with personal care. Those are the people that a patient and family would see most often. Those are the people that would provide the communication. One thing I think a lot of people don't know is that because the interdisciplinary team, the IDT, has to collaborate, communicate, or have a meeting um, once every two weeks. Um, we don't. We may not necessarily be meeting in person because with the pandemic there were restrictions on meetings, so we were doing it remotely. You know, calling in and Zoom video meeting in. But if the the IDT is meeting, and even if it's remote meeting, a family member and a patient can be involved in that team meeting for their own case. So it, say, for instance, your mother being on hospice, if you had a question and you wanted to be able to talk to several of the disciplines, the social worker, the nurse, the chaplain, the physician, all at the same time, when they have an IDT meeting, you as her daughter or caregiver or decision maker can be part of that meeting. If it's in person, you might be able to go in. If it's a conference call, you might be able to call in. And so that's a very unique part of the interdisciplinary team, interdisciplinary approach that I think is important. We think of the team as being your hospice people, your hospice professionals, right? The aides, worker, chaplain. But that group also includes the caregiving system, whether you're a hired caregiver or if the patient's in a facility, a memory care unit, we collaborate with those facility nurses and administrators, the director there. And the the caregivers, family caregivers, are part of that unit. That's true. The 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 service that I used for mom worked really closely with the community she lived in. It's why we chose them, because the one that did such a great job taking care of my dad three years prior, I think I think the pandemic kind of exploded their problems because we were having I. I called them. It took a couple days for them to call me back. I missed them. And then so that I left another message and then it was like a week later. Well, I didn't have a week since I didn't hear back from them fairly immediately. You know, within a day, I went with the recommendation of another family who are also clients of my husband's who had a relative in the same community as mom. I knew that they worked really closely with them. So it was like, this is all fine. And again, it was right at the beginning of the pandemic. So I think nobody knew what the heck was going on. And it was, it was a wild time. Let's put it that way. It made things very chaotic, I think. Yeah, I'm sure it was not fun. And one of the, so I've, I've got a couple good hospice stories and this is mostly the, um, coming from my experience with the nurses. When my mom was 
returned back to the uh, memory care at, from the hospital, um, her primary care person in the, in the community said, oh, we need the different kinds of, um, you know, depends, the diapers. And I'm like, I don't even know where the hell to get those, much less can I get those right now? Because again, by the beginning of the pandemic and the hospice nurse who had just happened to be standing there, she goes, oh, don't worry about it. We'll order those for you. And I was like, oh, thank God. I mean, just that little irritation of I'm not sure where to get, what to get, where to get it, how to get it. We got this pandemic thing going on. I don't know what's going on with my mom. It was just like, whoa. I mean, just that one little thing, just it, it was a weight off of my mind that you really don't even know that you're holding. And then my, because my dad really tried to refuse care from the care staff, the people that we had in their home, you know, he, you know, was getting weaker and he would try to stand up to, you know, go to the restroom or, you know, whatever he was trying to do. And I swear all the, all the people they sent were like small petite ladies like myself. I'm five foot two. So, you know, my dad was like five ten, five eleven. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he wasn't like a skinny waif of a guy. He wasn't huge, but he wasn't, he wasn't a small person. He, um, even with a gate belt, the caregiver lost control of, of his balance and he fell. So she logically called, um, for a lift assist from the fire department. They came, they asked him if he was okay. And they said, um, he said, no, um, I think I'm dying, which creepy. And so they whisked him off to the hospital and literally the hospice nurse is chasing the ambulance down the road because as you were probably aware, they're not supposed to go to the emergency room when they're on hospice. And it was craziness. So we had that experience twice with my dad during his hospice care. And you know, the nurses were, they didn't just throw their hands up and say, let me know when he comes back. They were like right there chasing down the hospital calling the staff at the hospital. My husband and I would call us. It was chaos, but it was chaos because of my dad. And they they dealt with all of it just wonderfully. <laughs> it was just... You know, it it can be confusing, the, the relationship between hospice and hospital. And patients can go to the hospital, but the expectation is, first of all, most of our patients, Patients come to us and they say, I don't want to go to the hospital. I've been there. I've done that a hundred times. I'm through with that part. And putting them in the hospital actually incurs a bunch of testing and procedures that they don't want. They've already had them. They already know the prognosis is poor. And so it's a waste of time, waste of money. And most of all, it's a waste of their energy, which reduces their quality of life. And hospice is all about promoting quality of life. And most patients, I mean, does that sound like quality of life to be sitting in the hospital? No, no. No, I, I loved it when they took him to the emergency room. The emergency room doctor called me and said, well, you know, your father's not well. And this was late in the, this was like bedtime. And I'm like, duh, that's why he's on hospice. Well, I understand that, but, and I'm thinking, but nothing, dude, put him back in the ambulance and send him back home. Right. I'm like, if I have to drive over to my parents' hometown, you're like 35 minutes away and deal with you in the middle of the night, not going to be pretty. Girlfriend is not happy after the sun goes down. And she's tired. <laughs> you know, it's just you like know they're, they're so wired in to saving and fixing mm -hmm. and thank goodness for it. You know, if something happened to me and I went to the emergency room today, I, it would be a blessing to have somebody that wanted no matter what to get in there and fix everything that was wrong with me and save me. But at some point, there is a mindset and an attitude shift where that type of philosophy and treatment is no longer appropriate. And I think it's clinicians working inside healthcare that we forget to have respect for other people's perceptions and beliefs about their conditions. You know, pa patients that refuse treatment to begin with, for instance, your father refusing dialysis. That's a really hard, pe hard thing for a lot of families to look at. We're so ingrained because the first thing the nephrologist tells you when you're diagnosed with renal failure is if you don't do dialysis, you'll die. So we do dialysis. And then they tell you after four to five years that dialysis no longer works for you. You're dying. And so we want you to give up the dialysis and move into hospice care. 
but five years ago, you told me if I didn't do dialysis, I would die. It's a really hard thing for our brains to, to wrap around. Well, and I think it must be very difficult for an emergency room physician to be like, oh, yeah, this guy's on hospice. Like, just send him back. Yeah, just <laughs> not what, loose. <laughs> yeah, it's like that's not how they're trained. And we wouldn't we don't really want them to be like that. But then again, sometimes we need them to be like that. So, yeah, that's that's a challenge. And I recognize it as a challenge, but they did tests and stuff. And I'm like, why? Like yeah. the guy's on hospice. Don't. And then I get bills. Ugh, and then I get bills from the ambulance company. It's like, oh my God, please. <laughs> like, yeah, it's expensive. It's expensive. Mm hmm. And the frustrating thing was the second time the hospital or the ambulance company should have known because I believe the hospice nurse was there. I don't remember. It was, it was always in the middle of the night, like 10 30, 11 o'clock at night. So they wake me up. I'd like just gone to sleep. They wake me up with this drama. You know, it's just like, and he, most people in kidney, in renal failure die within a couple of weeks. My dad lasted um, almost two months. So like I said, my family is very honorary, very stubborn. <laughs> Everybody's body is a little bit different. I, well, I think the donated kidney was still, it was still functioning, not well, but it was still functioning. So it was, it was, it was doing its darndest to keep him going and it just finally gave in. But yeah, it was, it was rough, you know, cause you kind of never were sure what was going to happen. And, you know, we were half hour, 40 minutes away, depending on which daughter you were talking about. But, you know, I like that you mentioned all the different therapies. I didn't even know that they did physical therapy and occupational therapy and pet therapy. <laughs> Hello, sign me up for that. Well, you the know. pet therapy is, you know, that's your psychosocial that's support. It would be therapy, a therapy dog, therapy animal, which is a wonderful component. Not every hospice has that because that's a very specialized uh, type of therapy, but speech therapy, occupational and physical therapy is a little bit misunderstood even by hospice professionals themselves because it's used very sparingly, very sparingly. And it's always used to promote safety or teach is how it should be used. So if you had, um, say, a family who had an Alzheimer's patient, fell and broke a hip, and they wanted to have it repaired, okay? So they have the surgical repair, and the patient comes back to the house but needs to finish the physical therapy. You can finish out the physical therapy, but to pursue it for a prolonged period of time wouldn't be beneficial. With an Alzheimer's and dementia patient, they can't retain the information for very long. You may get some temporary strengthening, but it's basically what we call medically futile. It's not going to have a long lasting positive effect. Speech therapy, occupational therapy, also there to teach, you know, two or three visits to teach a family good body mechanics, how to minimize choking. Uh, speech therapy would work with that. Or if they needed to provide and teach modified utensils um, for a patient that's having trouble feeding themselves, like using big, big handled forks and spoons or going strictly to a, a spork that the patient could use. The occupational deals with fine motor. And so they would do that for teaching. But as far as rehab and strengthening prolonged, you know, extended th therapies, that is not something that's hospice appropriate. That makes sense. And it's, it's beneficial to know that that stuff's an option because my dad didn't need it. Uh, we did not opt to repair mom's broken leg because she refused to deal with the, the um, physical therapist. Right. And I knew that in her advanced Alzheimer's, the anesthesia was probably uh, not a good idea. And I'm glad that that was the option that I chose because I honestly, when I saw her, the last day that I saw her awake was March 16th. I honestly thought that she would heal and yes, she would be in a wheelchair, I was totally fine with that. I was excited that I could get her from point A to point B in a re reasonable amount of time. You know, we were going to continue visiting the park and the pool and watching kids and doing all the stuff we did. Just, we were just going to use a wheelchair. And then they called me on March 29th and said that, you know, mom wasn't doing too well. And they thought she'd benefit from a visit from me. And I was like starting to lose my mind 
because I thought, you know, my mom thought I was her best friend. I was very concerned that she would forget that association with me and that she would be distrustful of even myself. And I thought this is going to be a nightmare if I, I'm like, I was literally restraining myself from calling the executive director who I had a very good relationship with and basically say, dude, I'm coming in. You want me to wear a garbage bag over my head, over my body? I can climb in through the window if you open it more than an inch. And, you know, because my mom had a window to the outside. I'm like, I can just go in through the window and never, ever go into the communal area. I mean, I would, I was really thinking hard about how to manage this uh, lockout that I was dealing with. And so I went on March 30th and I saw my mom. And as soon as I saw her, I knew I was like, oh, no, this isn't going the way I thought it was going. And Mm -hmm. so thankfully, and I feel so very, very blessed that they allowed this because I know so many families that didn't get to say goodbye. But I, you know, and I wasn't sure. Do I talk to her like the daughter or a friend? And I'm like, it's daughter time. And I said, you know what? You did a great job everybody's going to be fine. You know, we love you. It's just on and on all that stuff. And, and she was gone within about 27 hours. So I at least got to see her. So difficult for caregivers being separated like that. Yeah. And, and I, I only had to deal with it for two weeks. So I'm like, I could, my mom could not have done the window visits, the zoom stuff. None of that. That it would have, I would have lost my noodle. I would have been, (laughs) in desperate need of psychological care if I had, if, if she hadn't died, I don't know what I would have done. So I, I feel very, very blessed that it all went down the way it did, but it was still hard, but Mm. I'm very grateful that the hospice nurses were there because I know on top of the staff that was there to care for her, they had, they had extra and then they had extra at a time when they really needed some extra, like just maybe somebody to be like, what the hell is going on? Cause I mean, this was literally, they closed all, you know, we went into quarantine on the 16th of March, 2020 in the seven counties of the San Francisco Bay area. We were like the first, and I was like, okay, this is a, uh, this is exciting. <laughs> you know, like This is the weirdest thing I've ever gone through. And then, you know, we all know what's happened in the last two plus years. So right. hospice is definitely not something to avoid. That's why I wanted to have this conversation and and help educate people so they don't feel like they're just giving up because it's really not what you're doing. You have any last advice you want to throw out to people before we call it quits here today? I would encourage people to be advocates for themselves. Don't wait for somebody else to ask or somebody else to offer that information to you. Ask your doctor, ask your nurse practitioner. Bring it up, educate yourself, Um, listen to this podcast. You talk about being a caregiver, you know, educate yourself and find the resources that are out there. We know they're out there. The system is broken, but if you are an advocate advocate for yourself or someone you love, you're going to get better care. You're going to get more timely care and care that's better suited to you. So I would say just remember to be an advocate. Well, that's perfect. And I really appreciate you coming on my show. We've swapped, we've swapped episodes now. So I will make sure that to link, link to you guys, because I think people are going to have more questions and I'm sure they'll be able to get those answers by listening to any of your episodes. So it's definitely a, an excellent resource. And I appreciate that you helped educate my listeners today. Well, thank you. I'm glad to be here with you. If any of your listeners have questions, they can always email me. My email is helen at theheartofhospice.com. And of course, they can always just go onto the website and connect with us there. It's theheartofhospice.com. So nice to talk with you again, Jennifer. You're welcome. Thanks so much. Fading Memories is also available wherever you get your favorite podcasts.